The art of embroidery flourished in England during the 16th and 17th centuries, a period that witnessed extraordinarily creative uses of materials and techniques, some of which were perhaps unique to the Tudor and Stuart eras. The importance of decorative embroidery on fashionable dress and household furnishings during the 16th and early 17th centuries is reflected in the precise depictions of these items in portraits, such as this image of Queen Elizabeth I by Nicholas Hilliard from about 1575, as well as the detailed descriptions found in inventories of the period. In this portrait, the Queen wears a red velvet gown decorated with numerous pearls as well as jewels in gold settings. Her sleeves and the partlet which covers her neck and shoulders are a fine white linen embroidered in black silk thread, a style known simply as black work. These are covered with a sheer fabric which is striped with lace made of gold metal thread. All of this decoration would have been applied by an embroiderer. During the Tudor and Stuart eras, English society became more prosperous and a larger proportion of the population could afford luxury goods such as clothing and household furnishings decorated with embroidery made of imported silk and precious metal threads. In response to the rising demand for these luxury goods, King James I, Elizabeth's successor, seen here in a portrait of about 1606, encouraged the expansion of related industries in England, including silk weaving and metal thread production, in order to decrease the importation of foreign goods and to create jobs for the domestic workforce. An impressive variety of metal threads and ornaments were used in 16th and 17th century embroidery. Thin wires made of silver or silver gilt, either round or flattened, were manipulated into various shapes which were then employed for decorative embroidery. The most common thread incorporating metal is now called filet. It is composed of a strip of silver or silver gilt metal wrapped around a core thread, usually made of silk. The resulting thread is smooth and flexible enough to pass through the eye of a needle and can be used to create a variety of decorative stitches and textures, such as the plated braid stitch seen on this cap. Another type of metal thread much used during the 17th century was called pearl. A round wire was wrapped around a rod to create a coil, like a tiny, tightly wound spring. There were many variations on pearl, including wire which was wrapped with colored silk before being made into coils. Flattened wire or strips were also made into coils of varying diameter and thickness. These shaped wires were used on their own and secured to the surface of fabrics by a second thread as they could not be threaded through a needle themselves. Colored silk thread was also loosely wrapped with flat strips or round wires, which enhanced the silk's color. Men and women alike wore clothing and accessories with embroidery of silk and metal threads during the 16th and 17th centuries. One type of men's accessory was the nightcap, seen here in a portrait of about 1612 of Phineas Pett, shipbuilder to King James I. In damp and drafty 17th century buildings, warm headgear was desirable indoors as well as out in cold weather. Such decorated nightcaps were not worn for sleeping. Instead, they were worn by men on informal occasions at home or in the privacy of their place of business. The nightcap on view in the case to the left reveals the problem common to most of the blackwork embroidery that survives today. The silk thread has almost entirely disappeared, making the floral design of pansies, borage, and pomegranates hard to see. Unfortunately, the process used to dye the silk thread black causes it to disintegrate over time. In addition, the silver gilt and silver metal threads which create the vines and accent the petals and leaves have tarnished. There are no practical conservation techniques which can repair this damage, but portraits such as this picture of Elizabethan courtier Mary Cornwallis give us an idea of how these pieces looked when they were new. 
the contrast of materials created bold and dramatic black and white patterns. When this nightcap was new, the linen foundation fabric would have been a much lighter shade, almost white. Though the silk thread in the flowers has largely disintegrated, the stitch holes remain and these, along with the few better preserved areas of the design, help to determine what the original design looked like. The black silk was worked in a combination of stem stitch for the outline of the leaves and flower petals, and double running stitches and speckling stitches used for shading the interior of the petals and leaves. When restored, the shading imitates the effect of an engraving printed on paper. The silver gilt filet is worked in a very dense plated braid stitch for the vines and a reverse chain stitch for the tendrils. Silver filet worked in plated braid stitch and knots creates the accents on the flowers and smaller leaves. When their color is restored, the contrast between the metals becomes clear, further heightening the impact that this type of embroidery had when it was new. Aside from accessories like caps and gloves, very few complete garments have survived from the 17th century. However, at least 20 examples of a type of woman's jacket, such as the example shown in the adjoining gallery, exist in public collections today. These jackets appear to have been extremely fashionable from about 1600 to 1625. There are more than 50 English portraits from the first quarter of the 17th century which show women wearing similar jackets. This portrait of Lady Dorothy Carey, painted in about 1614 by William Larkin, reveals how these jackets were worn as part of an ensemble rich in contrasting patterns and textures including velvet, satin, and lace. The designs embroidered on these jackets are variations of a scrolling vine, usually composed of a plated braid stitch of gold metal thread, which supports a variety of colorful flowers, fruits, and even insects and birds rendered in silk thread. The Metropolitan Museum of Arts jacket is a particularly fine example of this type of garment, it is a veritable encyclopedia of flora, which includes roses, lilies, acorns, daffodils, carnations, and pansies, as well as pea pods, birds, butterflies, and caterpillars. The vines on this jacket are created of silver gilt filet thread worked in a complicated two-step wrapped ladder stitch. In the first pass, the needle threaded with metal thread creates a ladder-like pattern. The rungs and loops are made in such a way that the rungs stand out slightly from the foundation fabric, suspended between the loops at either side of the stitch. This creates enough space under the rungs for the needle and thread to complete the second part of the process. After the ladder stitch is completed, the second pass is worked. Another length of metal thread is brought to the surface, and this thread wraps the rungs of the ladder stitch together. The first two rungs are wrapped three times, then the second and third rungs are wrapped, then the third and fourth are wrapped, and so forth. In the animation, the stitch is worked with more open space between the individual threads for clarity. In reality, the stitch is much more densely worked and the tension of the wrapping process creates a slight chevron effect. The resulting effect of this dense two-step stitch is highly three-dimensional. The richness of this stitch justifies the extra time and materials required to create it. It probably took the embroiderer three to four times as long to complete and consumed two to three times as much metal thread as the more common plated braid stitch. As a testament to the enduring appeal of these elaborately embroidered women's jackets, in 2006, 
the Colonial Wardrobe and Textiles Department of Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts, embarked on a project to recreate one of these early 17th century women's jackets. Though there is no evidence that an early member of the Plymouth settlement had such a jacket, it was felt that this popular style embodied the qualities of fashionable dress of the Jacobean period, as they contrasted with the taste of the Native Americans with whom the early Plymouth colonists interacted. After examining a number of examples of this style, a decision was made to base the Plymouth Plantation recreation on a combination of elements from two jackets in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The most famous of these is the jacket owned by Margaret Layton and worn by her in a portrait by Marcus Gerhardt's, painted in about 1620, the same year that the Mayflower completed the 66-day journey to North America from Southampton, England. The decoration on the jacket, polychrome silk thread and silver gilt metal thread embroidery, is being produced by a dedicated group of volunteer embroiderers who began work on the 17 individual pattern pieces in June of 2007. The stitches on the jacket include a reverse chain stitch used to outline the floral motifs and semi-detached buttonhole stitches used to fill in the outline motifs, in this case the small blue borage flower. Separate motifs, such as individual butterfly wings and pea pod shells, were worked separately and then attached to the jacket pieces. A plated braid stitch and silver gilt thread was used to create the scrolling vines and a reverse chain stitch for the tendrils growing from the vines. All of the stitches were based on the technical details of the Victoria and Albert Museum's jackets, including luxurious finishing touches, such as the gold peas in the open pea pods, and the three types of thread used, which include ten shades of silk, seven shades of silk wrapped with gold metal, and silver gilt filet. Statistics kept during the Plymouth Project reveal that these elaborately decorated jackets were probably not produced by one individual embroiderer. They were more likely the product of a professional workshop. By October of 2008, more than 70 volunteer embroiderers had contributed over 2,300 hours of work, and only the polychrome silk motifs were complete. Very little of the plated braid gold vines were done. This is equal to about 287 eight-hour workdays, or more than 57 40-hour work weeks for the polychrome silk motifs alone. The total number of hours for the embroidery is projected to be about 3,500 hours, or more than 87 weeks of work. Many examples, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Arts jacket and the one worn by Margaret Layton, have trimmings of metal thread bobbin lace. Plymouth Plantation is reproducing a bobbin lace based on Margaret Layton's jacket in a combination of silver and silver gilt threads. It takes a volunteer lace maker about one hour to make one inch of lace using 18 bobbins wound with the metal threads. The lace is further embellished with teardrop-shaped spangles, which are being made on site by the Plymouth Plantation blacksmith. The spangles are made from silver wire plated with gold and then flattened into a ribbon or strip the approximate width of the finished spangles. The individual spangles are punched one at a time from the ribbon, and then a hole for threading is punched in the top of the spangle. The work is done on a block of soft lead, which helps to absorb the force of the punch tool and keeps the spangles from bouncing off the work surface. Seven to eight hundred of these spangles will be needed to decorate the ten feet of bobbin lace, which will edge the jacket front, hem, collar, and cuffs. In addition, small round sequins, or O's as they were called in the 17th century, will be stitched between the flowers and insects on the linen fabric of the jacket. The untarnished metal and clear, unfaded colors of the silk thread 
will give the 21st century viewer an idea of the color and sparkle that embroidery imparted to fashions of the 16th and 17th centuries. By the middle of the 17th century, the popularity of elaborately embroidered clothing and fashion accessories had waned. Rich metal thread embroidery continued to be part of royal and official regalia, but the inventive variety of thread types and techniques used in the 16th and 17th centuries had diminished by the end of the 1600s. Nevertheless, the pieces that survive still have the power to suggest the richness and complexity of the highest quality embroidery produced during the Tudor and Stuart eras, and these pieces continue to inspire both scholars and practitioners to this day.